Well, I don't think I've ever preached off of this little pulpit right here, but uh, I don't know where the I don't know where the big pulpit went. It's in that room over there. Well, we're going to leave it there for now because I don't have time to go get it. Hey, Pastor Brian, are those in, are those giving things on the table back there? Uh, we'll make sure they are before they just 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 point of order there. I, I think that they might not have. I think they got put away after the morning service, and we didn't bring them back out. All right, well, I just got a question for you. Did, did your team win today? <laughs> the Chiefs, the only team that matters in the, in the playoffs. Well, Pastor Weaver was praying. Everybody else was watching the Chiefs win. Did they win? I don't know. They did. Okay, yes, I think they did. <laughs> How many Chiefs fan in the room? How many Chiefs fan online? I see those hands. There's a few of you out there. And uh, we, uh, we are in a series. Uh, we just, this is the third in four, in four sermons in this series. And uh, it's things that Jesus never said. So if you missed the last couple of weeks, I encourage you to go back and watch. Pastor August kicked off the series uh, with, this, with this statement that a lot of people use that is really not in the Bible. Jesus didn't say it, nor did God say it, that he will never give you more than you can handle. It surprises a lot of people. Pastor Kerry did a phenomenal job last Sunday night, and I encourage you to go back if you missed that message. Uh, on this lie or something that Jesus never said is follow your heart. And all through scripture, it tells us over and over again, that's a bad idea because our heart above all things is, is wicked. And so um, that, it, that's a great message. If you miss it, go back and, 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 uh, and watch that message. And tonight, the uh, thing that Jesus never said that I'm going to tackle tonight is this, that uh, you deserve to be happy. A lot of people, listen, a lot of people make a lot of decisions in their life by saying something like this. You know, I deserve to be happy. I think God understands. I think God wants me to be happy. And with that statement, we can justify a lot of wrong a wrong behavior. And so maybe you've heard something like this. A woman leaves her husband for another man and justifies her decision by saying, I just wasn't happy in my marriage anymore. And I don't think God wants me to be miserable. I think he understands. I think he wants me to be happy. We, have a lot, we hear a lot of excuses all the time for all kinds of decisions that people make coming to this conclusion, I deserve to be happy or I think God wants me to be happy. So I want you to just weigh in on this. You, it's, it's already kind of been given to you the conclusion, but what do you think about this statement? Do you agree with the statement that God wants you to be happy? How many agree with that? Okay, let the record show no hands. Do you think God wants you to be unhappy? <laughs> Here's the problem. You know, we don't want to say God wants us to be happy, but we don't want to say God wants us unhappy. How do we, how do we handle this? I want to start with a verse of scripture, Psalm 97, verse 12, and we're just going to read that scripture that says, may all who are godly rejoice in the Lord. May all who are godly be happy in the Lord. Some versions say that's the New Living Translation. May all who are godly rejoice in the Lord. Here's, let me just start with this. The world's theology or philosophy on happiness. I believe that God wants me to be happy above everything else. And if I believe that that is true, then whatever makes me happy must be right. And whatever makes me unhappy must be wrong. So if I believe that God wants me to be happy above everything else, then discomfort and delays and trials and inconvenience and obstacles cannot be God's will. If something happens to me that I don't like, that I didn't want to happen, if something is inconvenient or difficult for me, and if God wants me to be happy and now I'm not happy, then it must not be his will. You see where that leads? So if I believe that God wants me to be happy above everything else, then without knowing it, I begin to worship things. 
This is where a lot of people uh, are, are living, bowing down to things like comfort and money and pleasure. Even people who call themselves Christians. Pursuing the God that will make them happy. They're bowing down at this altar of happiness, wrongly believing that above all, God wants me to be happy. So the challenge is, if happiness is the goal, then God really exists to serve me so that I can be happy. But the reality is, God doesn't exist to serve you and me to do what we want him to do. We are here to serve him. This is his world, we're his creation. He created us for himself. So if we believe that God is here to make us happy, then he's simply nothing more than a drive-through window service. And we just drive up, tell God what we want him to do, and in a timely manner, he needs to bring our order to us and hand deliver that to us however we ordered it, or else something's wrong. It's kind of like we treat God like a pop machine and we want to go up to that pop machine, put in the money that it tells us to put into it, and we push a button, and whatever that button is that we push, what is your favorite soda? Dr. Pepper. Thank you, Rod. (laughs) Hart Brothers. We push Dr. Pepper, we better get Dr. Pepper, and we want it right now, right? No, oh, no diet? That's, That's where we... We're on opposite sides of the rail, going the same direction. (laughs) But 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 this is this is this is what we've reduced God to to be a machine to bring us what we want when we want it. Now we may not like really say it like that. We may not really treat God that way. Um, But a lot of people expect God to respond like that. Like if I do certain things then God's gonna respond favorably toward me. If I go to church, if I pray, if I read my Bible, if I do good things, and if I don't do bad things, then God should do for me all that I want and all that I ask. And if God doesn't do that, then there's something wrong. What's wrong with God? God should do everything that I ask. He should give me a raise. He should heal my family member. He should save my spouse. He should make my marriage great. And he should make my favorite team win. And what what do we do if they don't? So the challenge is if God wants me to be happy above all else and I wake up one day and I'm not happy, then I'm left to draw the wrong conclusion and that is that if I'm not happy, then God has failed me. And this is kind of the way we, as a, as a whole, generally look at this. And I know we've got a room full of Christian people here, and we've, everybody here does not ever think of God in that way. We have never, ever expected God to do what we want God to do whenever we ask him to do it. But maybe in some way, we're guilty. So... The problem, we've got this cultural Christian world kind of view that many people will say something like this, I tried religion and it just didn't work for me. I went to a church for a few weeks, but I never got healed. I read some chapters in the Bible. I went to a small group, but I didn't get the job that I wanted. My marriage is still struggling. Therefore, God didn't make me happy, and God has failed me. That's the version of Christianity that a lot of people in America have subscribed to. And it's totally selfish, totally self-centered, very much an entitlement mentality towards God. God owes me. And if God isn't gonna do for me, then why should I give him the time? So listen, here's what I wanna say. Your happiness is not the highest priority for God. You being happy is not high on God's priority list. Now, I'm not saying that he wants you to be unhappy, but because there are some that say that God doesn't want you to be happy. He just wants you to be holy. I may have said something like that. There is a, there is a book, it's called Sacred Marriage, and... Um, I'm trying to think of the author because I don't even have this written down. But the premise of the book is, what if God didn't 
God didn't make your marriage for you to be happy, but for you to be holy. So the idea is not that we have to have either be happy or holy. I'm saying I think that those two are not mutually exclusive from each other. It's not that God doesn't want us to be happy. He certainly wants us to be holy. So um, I agree that holiness is more of a priority for God for our lives than happiness. But like I said, I don't believe that they're mutually exclusive. It's not that you choose one or the other. I believe it's possible for us to have both. But I don't believe that God wants us to pursue happiness. That's what I'm saying. Happiness should not be our goal. God wants us to pursue him. Tonight as we're worshiping, there's just, I know it's just a piano, but I don't know if you just sense something. I, I mean, I just sense like just a, a, a hunger, a deep hunger in my heart. I mean, I gather together here with all of you, with people online. Know that there's more of us than are sitting right here in the room. And when we come together, there's an opportunity for God to do something. And I wonder if we just go through the motions so many times or is there really a sense of hunger in our heart? Did we come tonight to pursue him? Not pursuing him for our happiness, but pursuing him for who he is. God is the goal. His presence, his will, not your happiness. Otherwise, we're simply using God for our purposes rather than God using us allowing God for us, for him to use us for his purposes. He doesn't want us to pursue happiness. He wants us to pursue himself. And in him, we'll find all the things that matter in life. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you as well. If we just seek first his kingdom, seek first his righteousness. Here's, here's what I want to say. God doesn't want you to be happy when it causes you to do something wrong or unwise. When it causes you to do something sinful or stupid. Which sometimes, sometimes happens. The pursuit of happiness has become kind of like the North Star that guides so many people today. I want you to think about the power of the pursuit of happiness. We enter into relationships because that person makes me, me happy. I can't tell you how many times I've done premarital counseling and I think this is just the human condition. Why do, we, why do we get married? Why do we choose someone in the first place? Honestly, you know, young people that get married, I think mostly it's selfish. How does that person make me feel? They make me happy. What they do for me makes me happy. And I'm so happy that I want to spend the rest of my life with them. We never stop to think, what is it that I do for this person? What is it that I offer? What is it that I bring? Usually there's a selfishness involved in it. But we enter into relationships because that person makes us happy. Most of our ambitions are driven by the idea of if I accomplish this certain goal, that, that's going to make me happy. At the moment that we realize that any of those things don't bring us the happiness that we expected, then we just move on to something else or someone else. How many of you have had those thoughts? You know, if I could just, if I could just own that car, if I could just drive around in that new car, how, how happy that would make me feel. Honesty. Honesty. Not even 10% of us have ever thought that before. I'm, I'm weird. I bought a 2013 Honda. I upgraded from my 2000 Toyota truck. And it made me so happy. And it still makes me happy when I sit in it. It doesn't make a lot of noise. It gets better gas mileage. But you know what? It, it, it's ultimately not fulfilling anything inside of me. But if we're honest, there are things like that that do make us happy. Getting, getting a new home makes us happy. But if we're not careful, then we'll convince ourselves that if I'm not happy, and since I'm not happy, then I'm allowed to do something that otherwise might be wrong. I wasn't happy with my job, so I quit. Even though I've got three kids that are under four years of age. I just wasn't happy there. My wife wasn't meeting my needs. That's the reason why I got into pornography. 
That's, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. We know that premarital sex is wrong, but we're in love. And I think God understands. And really, you know, in our hearts, we're really, kind of, we're really married anyway. We love each other so much. We'll justify a lot of things based on this idea of happiness. But God doesn't want to make you happy when it causes you to do something wrong or unwise and when it's only based on the things of this world. See, people tend to think that this is the formula that works, that better possessions, that peaceful circumstances, thrilling experiences, the right relationships, the perfect experience equals happiness. If I can just get all of those things working together. You see, happiness is defined as a, as a, a, a feeling of pleasure. It's an emotion of euphoria, excitement, or bliss. That's, that's the definition of happiness. And the problem is because happiness is an emotion. Happiness comes and happiness goes. And it can happen multiple times throughout a day. One day you feel it, the next day that you don't. And we need to be careful that we don't look to people or possessions or life circumstances determine, to determine how we feel or to determine our well-being. Your spouse was never intended to make you feel good all the time. Your work was never intended to be your source of security. Your relationships, your career, your college education, your home, your car, your bank account were never meant to be the measuring stick of your success. But how many people, it's based on those types of things. People continue to chase these things thinking that these are the things that will bring them true happiness. Ultimately, we need to learn from Solomon who found out that each of these earthly pursuits is like chasing the wind. Ecclesiastes 1.14, Solomon said, it's all meaningless. He pursued anything that his heart could think of. There was no, no stopping. He was, he was going to figure it out one way or another. And he came to this conclusion that everything is meaningless. Things fail. People die. People disappoint us. And in the end, the only thing that truly satisfies, the only thing that truly fulfills, the only thing that lasts forever is a relationship with God. And Solomon's final conclusion of Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he said, this is the final conclusion, fear God and obey his commands. Fear God, obey his commands. This is everyone's duty. Listen, listen to what Habakkuk says in uh, Habakkuk 3, 17 and 19, the end of that book. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. That's a pretty bleak, sad picture. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Now how in the world can we be joyful even though all those things are going on? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer and able to tread upon the heights. This is what John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So does God want us to be happy? I believe the answer is yes, it's okay. God, God's okay with us being happy. But not if our happiness is the goal. He is the goal. And I believe that God will give us the desires of our heart when we make him the, the, the pursuit. God wants us to be blessed. In Matthew chapter five, we have the Beatitudes. And the word there uh, for blessed, uh, some of your versions may say um, happy or joyful. It's mar markarios, which means supremely blessed or more than happy. 
And he goes through this list, blessed are those who, blessed are those who are poor, who mourn, those who are humble, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are merciful, those whose hearts are pure, who seek peace and are persecuted for doing what's right. Blessed are those people, happy are those people, joyful are those people who are, those who are pursuing those types of things. It doesn't mean that you'll never get sick. It doesn't mean that you won't lose your job. It doesn't mean that, you'll, that you won't ever have personal or relationship issues or struggles, that things will always go your way, that God will say yes to every one of your prayers, but you'll be blessed by the Lord. God does promise in his word that he will give comfort in pain, that he will give peace in the midst of a storm, that he will give you strength in your weakness and that there will be joy in your trials. He does promise those things. God wants good for his people. And this is what it says, the psalmist said in Psalm 37, four, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So what is it that we're pursuing? Is it happiness that we're pursuing? Or is it God and his heart that is our pursuit? Because when we take delight in the Lord, what does it mean to to delight yourself in the Lord? To delight in someone is to experience great joy and pleasure in their presence. Do you find joy and pleasure in the presence of the Lord? Do you take delight in him? Because when we take delight in him, then he gives us the desires of our heart, but that only happens when we know that person well. To delight in the Lord, we must know him better. His great love for us, his blessings, his mercy, his peace, his joy, his comfort, his grace, his forgiveness, his love. That gives us true delight. He goes on to say in verse five, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. Trust him and he will help you. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, his control, his guidance, and believe that he can care for you far better than you can care for yourself. That's the God that we are to put our delight in, our trust in. I want you to turn in your, in your Bibles if you have those. It won't be on the screen, but Philippians chapter three. This is a uh, passage of scripture where Paul talks about pressing on, pressing toward the goal. Verse, verse 12 of Philippians chapter three. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already attained or achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. It goes on in verse 17, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. This is, this is Paul speaking. And learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Listen to this. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. Does that sound like someone who's pursuing happiness based on worldly things? It will never satisfy or fulfill. He goes on to say, verse 20, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we eagerly are waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. But we are citizens of heaven. We don't belong here. So when we're pursuing earthly things as citizens of another country, It's just like Pastor Zach was talking about this morning. When we say yes to Jesus and we live a life of sin, it's like we we move to a different country. 
We no longer live in that house, in that area. We, we're citizens of a different place. And so our pursuit should be something completely different. I want to end with this illustration that is uh, borrowed from Max Lucado. I want you to think about a fish in the ocean. What if you were to take that fish and put that fish up on the beach? How do you think that fish is going to feel? What if on that, on that beach you, you got him a, a bunch of money and you just handed him a pile of cash? Is that going to make him happy? I mean, you give him a, a, a lounge chair where he can sit back there, maybe an a, a umbrella over his head, give him a nice sweet tea, all the snacks he wants, a Dr. Pepper that's not diet, give him some sunglasses, great food, great drinks. How do you think he's going to feel? Is that gonna make him happy? Why? A fish is never gonna be happy on the beach because a fish requires water. It wasn't designed for the beach. It was designed for the water. Listen, you and I, we're not made for this place. And the things of this place are never gonna make us happy. And there are people who are reaching, searching, looking, trying, doing whatever their minds can imagine to try to bring fulfillment and happiness and peace and joy into their life, and we're never going to find it with the things of this earth. So listen, what we deserve, Pastor Zach said this morning, we deserve punishment. We don't deserve anything. And to tell God, I deserve to be happy, not really true. What I deserve is punishment, but what I need is God himself. I need him more than, more than the breath that I breathe. So I want to ask you this, is your mind set on earthly things? Or you, do you desire fellowship with God? Are you willing to forsake temporary pleasures? Are you willing to walk by faith and not by sight? Are you willing to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God? Because it's then and only then that you will experience true happiness, joy, satisfaction, and blessing beyond measure. I'm going to ask Pastor Brett to come back to the piano. Our moments of happiness and joy here on this earth can never compare to the joy and the pleasure that we're gonna experience someday in heaven. And I'm telling you, if you can just hold out for just a little while, just a little while longer, you're in a race, you're running a race, and there's plenty of times where you get so frustrated and upset and discouraged and you feel like just giving up and quitting and getting out of the race. I deserve better than this. I want more than this. I'm tired. You ever felt that way? It's a pretty human response. But if we'll just remember the, the bigger picture and remember that we're in a race and we're closer to the finish line than when we started. Just a little longer. And it's not that God has left us here and there's nothing available for us. He's gonna give us the, the, the desires of our heart if we put our delight find our delight in him so I believe that God can pour out his spirit on us I believe that God can bless us beyond what we can ever imagine but it's not going to come because we're we're searching and seeking after the blessings of God but because we're seeking and searching after the heart of God and I believe that he will bring joy that is unspeakable and full of glory he'll bring peace that passes all understanding when we seek after and search him. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I just wanna ask you tonight, just from your own heart, being honest in your heart, are the things of this world, do they capture your attention? to the point where you're thinking about those things and your own pleasure and your own happiness? Or is it God's heart that you think of? 
How many of you say tonight, Pastor Jeff, I, I, I need a recalibration in my heart because I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself looking after, seeking happiness from this world, a fulfillment and a joy from this world that I understand again tonight is not going to happen like I've imagined it in my heart. There's no home, there's no car, there's no amount of money in a bank account, in a retirement account. There's no person, there's no thing that is ever gonna fulfill that but Jesus. And tonight you say, I need a recalibration, a refocus in my life to look to Jesus, to find that peace and contentment and fulfillment and happiness and joy. And you just raise your hand saying, that's me, that's me. God, tonight for every person in this room that's raised their hand, for every person that's joining us online, God, that you would speak into our hearts and lives, even in this moment tonight. God, we set aside time, we take time, we, we make room for you in our lives. And I believe that even your Holy Spirit is speaking to many here that are listening right now of something in their life that probably just needs to be to be set aside and put away. Some things that we've been pursuing, some things that have been taking uh, time and attention in our own lives away from you. And so tonight, uh, God, I pray that you would speak into our hearts and lives, recalibrate our hearts, our focus, our vision, that our, our pursuit, God, wouldn't be the things of this world because we don't belong to this world. They're never gonna satisfy us because we're not made for this place. We're citizens of heaven. We're children of, of the king. Help us to live according to your purposes and your plans. I'm not trying to have you fulfill our purposes and our plans. We ask forgiveness. We repent of our ways and ask that you would be glorified and that you would be pleased in us that we would find pleasure in you when we've allowed you, God, to have control and rule of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God's above the circumstances. Our happiness, our joy is found in him. Would, I want us to take, if you'll just take five minutes before you go. I know you're standing. If you want to find just a seat where you're at, find a place up here somewhere, if you would just take five minutes before you leave and just open your heart to the Lord connect with him and you're free to be dismissed whenever that is but I just encourage you to take some time right now it's five minutes if you leave at four it's okay if you stay past five and you do six minutes you're not more spiritual than anybody else but we'll just take some time to wait on the Lord and seek after him